So a quick recap. Every human activity aims at some good. Now, the good might be something outside the activity, or it might be the activity itself. And we agreed that there is a good which every single activity aims, aims at, as well as all the minor goods. So the builder, the miner, the person staying at home, that when you're studying, all these have individual goods, but it, they all aim towards another good, and that other good is happiness, which is the ultimate good. We discussed what it meant for something to be good, and that is that it's, an, it's, it's, to, it's to do with something's function and doing its function well. We then spoke about human nature, and that it's different to plant and animal nature, in that humans have an intellect and will, which are the two powers of our immaterial soul. And then therefore our good will have something specifically to do with our soul. And so happiness is an activity, what that activity is we'll get onto, of the soul. And it has to be according to reason, because reason is that power we use to determine what to do, to determine anything. Before we get going onto the next bit, in which we'll be talking about virtue, how virtue is the road of happiness, how virtuous actions effectively is happiness. We'll speak about the role that friendship plays in the happy life. And then we'll tie everything together and speak about the active life and the contemplative life. I'll paint a picture of what the happy man looks like so you get some concrete examples. And then also I will link all of this to the role of the government because actually the ethics really is part one and part two is the politics. And Aristotle basically says, if you want to know what the point of the government is, well, the government's for the individual, so you have to know what the point of the end of the individual is. So all of this, all this ethics, is nestled in how ought you to run a state. So we'll speak a bit about that. But there's one more thing, one more observation, which I want to point your intellect to before we move on. And it's an observation that Aristotle made, and it's this. Every single animal seems to have some sort of defining feature. The turtle has its shell. The cheetah has speed. The chameleon can camouflage, as can the zebra with other members of the herd. Carnivores have sharp teeth. And then Aristotle says, well, what, were, what, what do humans have? What, what feature do humans have? And again, he, and then he, he, he uses this as an example, well, the gods gave human reason. So that's another little sign of the immaterial soul, the fact that we have no physical feature, defining feature, any prowess. The thing that defines us is our, our soul. In fact, biologists like to say things like our thumbs and our hands, and that's the thing that makes us human. But really, we can only use our hands in the way we do because of the ideas we have. You know, we can only create a building because we can have an idea of a building beforehand. So that's another little, another little thing about humans having souls. Okay. So Aristotle then, this is an outline by the way, this is still, the ethics is composed of 10 books, this is halfway through book one, is he gets to this point. So this is beginning, beginning, beginning. And he says, the activity, any, all the activities, let's leave the soul out of, out of there for a minute. All the activities of human nature, which are according to reason, are virtuous activities, or virtuous actions. Getting drunk isn't an activity according to reason, because when you get drunk, you lose the powers of your intellect and will, so you become an animal in a sense, and that's not according to reason. And so drunkenness is a vice, and sobriety is a virtue. See what I mean? Envy is unreasonable, because envy is the feeling of sorrow you have in seeing someone else's good and then desiring it. But you desiring it doesn't, doesn't give it to you. You're left with nothing. It, it, it's, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense. It's a vice, right? And the opposite of envy 
What would that be? Generosity. I'm not sure. Anyway, but the opposite would be, would be virtue. The point is envy is a vice. Okay. What is a... Before we... Would it be quite a kind of charity? Because... Um, Yes, exactly. Yes, you take pleasure in others. Right. Yes, t it's a sort of charity, a love for the other. Yeah. Okay. So that's that genero So generosity. So that would be the virtue. Okay. So that's that's where virtue and vice comes from. And when people talk about something being moral, it's a bit. It's not a useful word. It's a bit vague. Like, what does that mean? But effectively, a moral action is just an action that makes sense. It's an action according to reason. It's an action which is logical. And an immoral action is just stupid. An immoral action is an action that doesn't lead to happiness because it doesn't make sense. It's unreasonable, right? OK. So what is a virtue? Aristotle says, one, is it a capacity? He says it can't be a capacity because if the, sh the soldier who has a capacity can to defend his country, well, that's good for nothing because he might use that capacity to just slaughter lots of innocent civilians. So the capacity for doing good isn't enough because he might use that capacity uh, to do evil. So simply having a capacity isn't good. And this is, the, this is why we call someone clever, right? A dictator might be clever, but he's not good. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? So having capacity for something that isn't virtuous necessarily because it can be used for vice. You say it's cunning. Or... Cunning, okay. Cunning. Clever cunning. You might be a good dictator. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Was it Tintin Nartus? Is that chap? The Roman one? Is it a pathos? I might have botched that in ancient Greek. Pathos basically means a feeling, a passion, and desire. There's that that encapsulates all these things. But it can't virtue can't be that because I think even the virtuous man, Aristotle would say, yeah, the virtuous man might go into battle absolutely terrified but he has control over himself, so he does it nevertheless. Do you see what I mean? So the virtuous man doesn't necessarily feel, he's not passionless, nor does he act according to passion, but he keeps his pathos, his feelings, passions, and desires, he keeps them in check, in check and always ordered by reason, right? Because it's an action according to reason. So it's not just a feeling. It's not, the virtuous man doesn't always feel good things. He might feel a certain way and say, nope, I'm not going to act according to that feeling. So it's not a feeling. So it's this third thing. And in ancient Greek, it's a hexis. What that means is a state. And what, and what hexis really means, as, as if you go on the LFSPN YouTube, Mr. Taylor's an excellent video on virtue, that virtue in Latin is a habitus. And in English, that means a having, a possessing. In the same way that a monk, his habit, he always wears it, he always carries it with him. In the same way, the virtuous man possesses a quality and that quality is virtue. So that's what it is. It's you have virtue. It's something you have and, and, and then you do according to that. So it's a state, and you, you always act according to that way. But I'll get into that more. Now, Aristotle says that someone can do a virtuous activity, but they themselves not be virtuous. So, for example, if Xavier, if Elias was to drop 20 pounds as he was walking by and his brother Xavier was walking behind him. He picks up the 20 pounds and he thinks, oh, I could use this money for the LFSPN new camera equipment. Well, wouldn't that be really good? And then he says, 
Ah, oh, no, it, this is Xavier's money. My reason tells me I need to give it to back to, uh, my reason tells me to give it back to Elias, so I'll give the money back to Elias. Now, Xavier's not a virtuous man, and we know he's not virtuous because he struggled in giving back the money, but nevertheless, Xavier gave back the money, so it was a just action, even if Xavier himself isn't virtuous. See what I mean? And for an action to be virtuous, you not only need to do the good thing on a surface level, but Aristotle says you have to have the right intention. In other words, you can't do a virtuous thing by accident. If I, if I was to drink, there's no more water left. If I was to drink this water thinking it's vodka, but in the end, I drink vo in the end I'm drinking water, then what I'm doing is, is virtuous because I'm drinking water, I'm hydrating myself. That's a good thing. But I did it by accident because I intended to drink vodka, so actually it wasn't virtuous at all. It was an accident that I did the right thing. Does that make sense? So you need, to, you need to know what you're doing and you need to know that you're doing the right thing and then do it. You can't do it by accident. Now, how do you become someone How do you become someone who doesn't have virtue? To someone who becomes virtuous. It's a habit, so you acquire the habit by repeatedly doing. So it hurts, and you struggle the first time, and maybe you struggle a bit less the second time. Yes. The way you the way you become virtuous is by doing the virtuous thing. Now. The first time you do the virtuous thing, the first time you get back from school and you don't go straight on your phone, but you go straight to your desk, it's so difficult, it's so painful, it's like, oh, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this, and you do it, and then the next time it's a bit, le it's a bit easier, and then the next time it's a bit easier, and then once you get to the point where you do the action easily, without any resistance, that's the point you know you have the virtue. And the virtuous man is like this. He's like the ice skater, doing all the twirls, really difficult things, and yet whenever we look on an ice skater on TV, it, it's like they could do it in their sleep. It looks effortless, it's graceful, it's easy. Do you see what I mean? So too the virtuous man, not only does he do the right thing, but he does the right thing easily, with grace, to the right amount, to the right extent, in the perfect way. It's all, it's all good, it's all perfect. That's what the virtuous man looks like. So the more you do something, the better you become at it. Exactly. In other words, a virtue is simply a good habit, and a vice is simply a bad habit, right? And now, Aristotle says that the person who's so used to doing the wrong thing, finds it really, really difficult, first of all, to recognise what the right thing is. Because when we do something, it affects, it affects our soul. And so the more we do the bad thing, the easier it becomes to do the bad thing, and the more soft our intellect goes. Mr Taylor always used the example of a thief, right? The first time you steal some sweets from a shop, it's really difficult. And then the more you do it, the more you do it, the more you do it, suddenly you don't break a sweat stealing a thousand pounds. And then at that point, for that person to realise that I need to stop stealing and I'm going to stop stealing, I mean, it's, it's, it's really difficult. It's really difficult. So our actions, in a sense, shape our soul and we want that soul to be, our soul to be shaped so that it has virtue. Okay. Finally... Put your hands up if you've heard about Aristotle virtues being a mean between two extremes. Have you heard about that, anyone else? That it's a mean between two extremes? But also that it's an extremist. Huh? Yes, but it's not a mean in the sense of it's bang in the middle. 
It's simply somewhere in between, and each, depending on the second. It's, it's above the bit between the two extremes. Uh, Maybe that's something you haven't read. No, that, no, no, no. <laughs> so, for example, let's let's think of a virtue. Justice. No, that's a bad one. Um, fortitude. Fortitude. Great. Now, on one side of fortitude is recklessness. And on the other side of fortitude is cowardice. Now, and what Aristotle does in books, in books two he speaks about the virtues in general, and then in books three, four, I think five, he devotes a whole chapter to justice, to the virtue of justice. He lists through, he goes through the virtues and he shows how it's a mean between two extremes. But it's not that, it's not an exact science. There's no hard and, hard and fast rules which can tell you, which can tell you how far you need to go. It's, you, you need to use your reason. In other words, to, be for, to have the virtue of fortitude, you need to do what the, forti the man who has fortitude does. You need to do... Sorry? The brave man. Yeah, you need, to be brave, you have to do what the brave man does. To be just, you have to do whatever the just man does. And to know what that is, happens, just, it happens over practice and time. So, if we take the virtue of anger, it's not to... But the mean isn't saying that you should always be sort of mild, never too soft, never too angry. But in fact, in some situations, you have to be extremely angry. In other situations, you have to be extremely meek. And in other situations, somewhere in between. But that it always falls between an extreme of too much and too little. And depending on the circumstances, that always changes. And the virtue which tells us where the mean is, is the virtue of prudence. All the virtues, fortitude, bravery, uh, witticism, like being funny, um, being just, being, having, having modesty, all these virtues, to know how to execute them, to know where the mean lies, is dictated by the virtue of prudence, which is an intellectual virtue. And Aristotle says, if you don't have the virtue of prudence, it's, impossi it's impossible for you to be a virtuous man. Because you, you, don't, you, just, you don't know. Prudence is about knowing. It's about putting the principles into action. So if you can't put ethical principles into action, then, then you can't be virtuous. So I need to, we need to stop there and... And then we'll pick up after the break, after the rosary. Okay.